Thank you, Karen. We're very happy to be uh, returning uh, sponsor official trade day uh, again this year, and uh, welcome to all of you. Mila has uh, two words that have been associated with them since its inception in 1899, and those two words are immer besser. And immer besser translated into English is forever better. And why is it forever better? Because everything that we do, if it's quality of product, everlasting design, sustainability, or true innovation, it's all about forever better. After this, um, this talk here with uh, Mr. Ford, at noon, you can actually take a look at our booth and you'll see when we talk about innovation, we're actually able to cook a fish in a full block of ice. That's true innovation, that's immer besser, that's Mila. Thank you. Hey everyone. So uh, I hope you're all enjoying IDS as much as I am. So I'm Mark Teo and I'm the web editor for Azure. And today I'm very excited to be introducing Michael Ford. So Michael actually appears in the latest issue of Azure. And I think the reasons why will become very clear during this talk. Now, if you're interested in appearing in Azure, I, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to apply to the AZ Awards. So now it's now in its eighth annual edition. Um, and the AZ Awards basically invites um, a, an international panel of architects, interior designers, and landscape architects to define the year in design excellence. So our deadline for submission to the AZ Awards will be February 20th, but I invite you to uh, submit to our early bird deadline, which is on February 1st. So don't worry if you can't remember all these dates. We have cards on your seats, and we, our booth is just over there, like steps from the stage. So if you have any questions, by all means, come find us. So uh, enough about the AZ Awards for now. So what I'd like to talk about for a second is Dead Prez. So in the year 2000, Dead Prez released probably what's their most famous song. It's called Hip Hop. So you've probably heard it. Like the chorus goes, it's, it's still bigger than hip hop, hip. I'm not doing, I'm not doing the song justice. But, um, but at the time, Dead Prez said that song was a critique of the music industry. But they also used that song to be a larger statement that, about the fact that their music is about more than just music. So their music is about race. Their music is about a lived experience. Their music is about equity. And all these things make me think of Michael Ford. So Michael Ford, as mentioned earlier, is called Hip Hop Architect. And I think, again, when you hear him speak, you'll understand why. Um, so Michael was born in Detroit, but he currently lives in Madison right now, where he is an architecture instructor at Madison College. There he teaches about design justice and about how modern architecture has, has influenced Hip Hop and vice versa. So Michael isn't just an academic. Uh, he's also the mind behind the Hip Hop Architecture Camp, which aims to connect underrepresented youth to the worlds of architecture and design and urban planning. And, um, and this July, he's going to be bringing that to Toronto, or North York, really, but Toronto. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, he also sits as a lead architect at the Universal Hip Hop Museum in the Bronx. So um, in an interview earlier this year, he told us that he plans on taking that museum on the road and uh, I really hope he brings it here because I'd be really excited to see it. So, uh, so what makes, makes Michael such a vital voice um, is his analysis of the built world. So at Azure, we spend a lot of time talking about the transformative nature of architecture and how architecture can impact the world for the better. And that's, that's very true, but Michael also adds another essential perspective. He talks in his work about how, how architecture can be used to elevate but also how it can be used to marginalize and how it can have unintended consequences. He talks about why we need a wider range of perspectives in architecture and, critically, how to get there. So just like Dead Prez's work is bigger than hip hop, I'm going to suggest that Michael's work is bigger than design. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Ford. Hello, everybody. So that was a song by uh, the artist formerly known as Most Deaf, uh, Yasin Bey. But he asked this question, uh, where are you going? And he says that wherever you're going, that's where hip hop is going. And for me, uh, as a 
young man growing up in the city of Detroit who was born into hip hop culture and raised on hip hop culture. Uh, as I went to school for architecture, uh, it was pretty clear for me that I wasn't going to check hip hop at the door, but I was gonna bring hip hop culture in uh, as I came into the world of architecture. And as I go through this presentation, I always tell people, it's a little bit of parental advisory. There will be some words that you will hear that I say, don't repeat outside of this space unless you're ready to hear the consequences of repeating those words. Uh, but I think we can all respect the language and some of the things that are true to uh, hip hop's uh, nature. So I travel around uh, the US, but now it's my first time doing this internationally. Uh, I traveled around giving lectures about the intersection of hip hop culture and architecture. So everywhere from Harvard's Graduate School of Design, recently appeared on the Today Show, uh, and also keynoted at the AIA conference. Uh, but Michelle Obama was the other keynote, so people probably did not hear that I was one of the other keynotes there. And for anybody who wants to take pictures or photographs, i love for you to do that. But i also love for you to tag me on social media. So uh, on Twitter, the hip hop uh, is hip hop arc. On Instagram, the hip hop architect. Um, and anywhere you post that's using the hashtag, uh, hip hop arc would be great. And if you're looking to get your followers up, I'll follow you back after the lecture. Um, so yeah, so go ahead and, and share those photos. So before I talk about hip hop architecture, I want to talk about what happens at the, uh, the intersection of black culture and what I'll call otherness. So what happens uh, when we combine those two items? And what I say happens at that intersection is innovation. So I'll go through a series of images uh, that I'll call before and after hip hop. So this is the Eames chair right, before hip hop. And this is the Eames chair after hip hop. So this artist took the Eames chair and put a turntable in the ottoman, put speakers in the chair, and he wanted to allow people to feel music. This is Mona Lisa before hip hop. This is Mona Lisa after hip hop. Or an artist had an exhibit at MOCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art and Design uh, in Detroit, and he painted hip hop artists in the same light and medium as Mona Lisa, uh, Snoop Dogg and, and 50 Cent there. And here is the swan chair before hip hop. It's a swan chair after hip hop. Uh, this was a project I worked on with a textile designer uh, in Detroit. Uh, this company is called Al Wasam, but they make these very high count, uh, high stitch count leather coats. Uh, you're not from Detroit and a part of hip hop culture if you don't have an Al Wasam coat. And he wanted to kind of remix, if you will, uh, some popular furnishings. And we looked at uh, adding uh, his coats or his textiles uh, to the swan chair. This Timberland boots before hip hop. And then Timberland boots after hip hop. Don't even need to change the image. <laughs> All right. Once Timberland boots became synonymous with hip hop, the whole meaning behind the boot changed, right? Before hip hop, it was seen as a, a boot that you would wear as a contractor. You needed some steel toe boot to protect yourself out on job sites. But once it became synonymous with hip hop, the moment you got it dirty, the moment it was scuffed, uh, the boots were then trash. NBA shorts before hip hop, it's a mistake waiting to happen. <laughs> NBA shorts after hip hop, if you're a basketball fan at all, the University of Michigan, uh, they had a documentary on ESPN's 30 for 30 called The Fab Five, where they were known for uh, first wearing some of the longer shorts uh, as college players, which eventually uh, led to some of the fashion you see today. These are still short by uh, today's standards. Uh, and speaking of basketball, you got basketball itself. This is basketball before hip hop. So Naismith, uh, the, the creator of basketball. And shout out to Toronto. This is basketball after hip hop with Drake becoming one of the ambassadors for the Toronto Raptors. And then we have a record player before hip hop, which turned into what? You can shout out right there. All right, I heard one right here, turns able, exactly. So hip hop took uh, their grandparents, their parents, record players, turned these into turntables. Try it again, headphones before hip hop turned into what after hip hop? There we go, we got more people, we turned it to beats. And President of the United States before hip hop. 
after hip hop, it was, no, it wasn't Obama, it was Bill Clinton, our first black, pre no, it wasn't, it was, no, it was President Barack Obama who used hip hop not once but twice to mobilize first time voters uh, to help him get into the White House. And we got disinterested in politics and yeah. All right, so, and now we have uh, one of the most iconic images of architecture, Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water. So this is architecture before hip hop. And after hip hop is exactly what I'm here to uh, discuss today. So this idea of mixing architecture and black music uh, is not a new concept. A lot of times I meet people like, oh, hip hop and architecture, that's so wild. How did you come up with the idea? Um, it, it's not only me who talk about this concept, um, and I'm not the person who came up with it. I mean, people have explored mixing music and architecture for centuries. And one of the people I like to point out is uh, Le Cabousier, right? Kind of the poster child of, of architecture. And there's a story of Le Cabousier meeting a jazz artist. Her name is Josephine Baker. Anybody heard of Harlem Renaissance before? All right, so a few people heard of the Harlem Renaissance. But the Harlem Renaissance, um, this is where jazz was created. Um, and Josephine Baker was the face of jazz music. Uh, Le Cabousier was in the prime of his career at the time, and they met on a cruise. And during that meeting, uh, Le Cabousier became very interested uh, in Josephine Baker and in black music uh, when he saw her perform. And I'll stop telling the story. There's a song that tells the story a lot better than I can. And it's a song by Biz Marquis called Just a Friend. And be warned, you will have to sing uh, here in a second. So hopefully everybody knows the song. But if you read the lyrics of a Biz Marquis uh, song, Just a Friend, I'll play it, part of it and show you the lyrics. Uh, it de describes the two of them meeting for the first time. You know the song, but um, during that time, again, Josephine Baker and uh, Le Cabousier met, but this story that Biz Marquis tells, I mean, it describes their relationship. And Corbu, uh, he has a very interesting past uh, with the Me Too movement. I think there should be a lot of Me Too's that could talk about Corbu. He was a very sexist uh, individual. Uh, and to me, I'll outright say that he was a little racist as well, but he is one of the most celebrated architects. And I'll show you why I said uh, some of those things that people may, uh, like, hey, why would you call them sexist or racist? But uh, you can see here in the image uh, when they met, you can see Josephine Baker trying to get away from him uh, right there in the corner. But what is it that she had that he needed? What did Josephine Baker have? And this is a quote from Corbu at the time. He said, Negro music has touched America because it is the melody of the soul joined with the rhythm of the machine. It is in two-part time, tears in the heart, movement of the legs, torso, arms, and head. The music of the era of construction, innovating. It floods the body and heart. It floods the USA and it floods the world. And then he will go on to say that jazz is more advanced than the architecture. And if architecture were at the point reached by jazz, it would be an incredible spectacle. And this is what Josephine Baker had. She had the pulse of jazz music. And Corbu wanted to tap into her creativity to see if he can find out anything that made jazz so spectacular. How can artists who are not traditionally trained come together and make some of the most beautiful music? They could use instruments in ways that trained musicians could not use it. He wondered if it was possible that people who are not architects could use architecture to create some spectacles that people who are trained as architects currently cannot do. So this idea of mixing black music and architecture is not new. But the only difference here is that I'm not Corbu, I'm a black man. I'm not someone who is trying to tap into someone else who have mastered the craft. I'm a part of, hip -hop of the hip-hop generation. I know it 
Uh, I'm a part of it. I live, breathe, and eat hip hop every day. Uh, so there's a few differences, but this idea is not totally new. Uh, this is something that was pondered by, uh, again, one of the most celebrated architects of all time. So a uh, little joke, often call him the forefather of hip hop. This was something just to piss off uh, instructors or professors across the country because they would say, what does he have to do with hip hop? But Corbu and his visions for uh, modern town planning would actually lay the groundwork that would eventually create the environment that necessitated the birth of hip hop culture. So in his plans for um, the center of Paris, uh, he wanted to create a new space for working class citizens. He wanted to liberate the working class. And these plans were never built. Paris did not know the implications of uh, such uh, monotonous or high density living. So his plans for the center of Paris were never incorporated, uh, but they would go on to be incorporated here, in, well, not here in the US, but back in the US. So he wrote a book called The City of Tomorrow and It's Plenty. And in the book, he talks about his idea for modern town planning, and I'll just point out five uh, items that he shared. So he talked about giving translucent prisms of glass. These were the towers that he would provide for the working class citizens. Uh, well, not so much for the working class citizens, but I should say these were places of employment. Uh, these were these towers that you see uh, in a previous image. And then around the perimeter were these tenement housing. Um, but what he was trying to do was provide immediate access to employment for working class individuals, vast lawns that would surround the residents. He wanted to provide them with shade. He talked about being under the shade of trees. And then he wanted to give them clean air and no noise. This is utopia. I mean, he was trying to create this perfect environment, uh, even the design of his architecture, right? It was a crucifix. He thought that people inhabiting his space, uh, if they were to go through his space, live under this regime that he created, they will automatically become better people. Uh, he called his architecture a machine. Totally crazy. Paris, like, no, it's not happening. Um, but there was a man named Robert Moses, and I call this the worst remix in history. Uh, he took some of those items that uh, Corbu wrote that were necessary for his scheme to be successful. And Robert Moses was a, a developer most famous for his work uh, throughout New York City. But as he built a freeway, the Cross Bronx Expressway, which went through the Bronx and decimated uh, black and brown communities along the way, he looked to Kaboo's plan to fight against um, moving citizens away from their, their current residence. So he wanted to try to deal with displacement. And the bad thing he did is he struck through everything that Kaboo said was necessary. The translucent prisms of glass eventually became these brick or concrete monotonous towers, immediate access to employment, that's not happening. Vast lawns that surround residents, right? Those tall towers most of the time did not allow trees and grass to grow. So you usually would have parks that had shards of glass and look like anything besides a park. Uh, so under the shade of trees, uh, that also was taken away. And then clean air and no noise. Uh, definitely was not this utopia that he described. And there's a song, once again, that describes the, what I call the urban reality of this urban renewal scheme. And it's the most popular hip hop song of all time, uh, as said by Rolling Stone. Uh, but hip hop does agree with the Rolling Stone and says it's the most popular hip hop song of all time. But if you look at those five items um, that were defined by Corbu, and you're gonna see exactly how uh, this remix was done horribly. So usually when we remix something in hip hop, we'll have a song and then we'll extract a sample from that song. And then that sample is either sped up, uh, slowed down, we may loop it, uh, but eventually that sample will become a totally new song. And that sample that we extract is something that evokes a very specific emotion, right? It's that song that you've heard before, it's that beat, that lyric, that word is something that you can relate to. So when it's in this new environment, it still evokes that same emotion. But again, Robert Moses done away with that, and he took the one thing that was heavily criticized 
as opposed to the thing that people wanted to celebrate uh, with Kraboo's plan. He took just the architecture itself. So one last look at these items from Corbu, and listen to this song by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. In a minute. So uh, it, this sample would lead to the birthplace of hip hop. One of the things that people don't know about hip hop culture is that it has a birth birth date, and it also has a birthplace. So New York City Parks and Recreation officially recognizes 1520 Cedric Avenue as the birthplace of hip hop culture. 1520 Cedric Avenue uh, is located near the South Bronx Expressway. Uh, it was built at the suggestion of Robert Moses, and it's based on Le Cabousier's scheme for th that people call towers in a park in Paris. So this physical place is where hip-hop was born. And what happened here is this is the first time that a DJ used the same exact record on a turntable. It's a technique called the merry-go-round. Uh, it's called, D uh, the DJ was DJ Cool Herc. Uh, but this, again, is the, the birthplace of hip-hop culture. And this is a criticism by a magazine uh, during the 1920s when Kerbu came out with his book where they said, is the next generation really destined to pass its existence in these immense geometrical barracks, living in standardized mass reduction houses with mass reduction furniture? Their games, and by that I mean their recreations, are all based on the same model. Poor creatures, what will they become? In the midst of all this dreadful speed, this organization, this terrible uniformity, so much logic taken to its extreme limits, so much science, so much of the mechanical everywhere Pre present and challenging one on every page and claiming its insolent triumph on every possible occasion. It will go on to say, here's enough to discuss one forever with standardization and to make one long for disorder. So this is Paris predicting hip hop. Like they're saying that if people will come and live in these geometrical barracks that Kabu is planning, uh, they're gonna long for disorder and we're not gonna do it. Uh, so this is a prediction of hip-hop almost 50 years before hip-hop culture was born. And then within lyrics, you'll start to see more and more critiques of architecture. Uh, this is a song uh, by Wu-Tang where Inspector Dex says, you know, he's sampling, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. And what he goes on to say is, in the PJs, the heat blaze and beats raid. Can't see the cage but can't leave the streets of rage. And then another artist, Street Life, he goes on to say, Street Chronicle, wise words by the abominable, high honorable, rap quotable phenomenal. Seniority kid, I speak for the minority. Ghetto poverty, fuck the housing authority. So they're starting to see that uh, the US and public housing authorities uh, going by this model that was heavily criticized, uh, there's something up. And I'll eventually let you know what that is. But uh, throughout lyrics, you're starting to see something about rats in a cage. This is a song called West Coast, by West Coast All-Stars called Same Game. It's about stopping the violence. And Digital Underground says, I'm in a rage. Oh yeah, why is that, G? Because other races, they say we act like rats in a cage. I tried to argue, but check it. Every night in the news, we proved them suckers right. And I got the blues. So I've heard these songs many times as a kid. Uh, and really didn't start to think heavily about him until uh, I, I got a lot older. But again, he says, I'm in a rage because other races say we act like rats in a cage. Uh, what is he talking about? Uh, I won't go a lot into his work, but he's talking about this guy named John B. Calhoun. He is like the father of urban sociology. He basically used rats and mice. And he done these experiments for years where he put them in uh, high-density living situations. He was very strategic with his wording. He would put rats and mice uh, in towers, what he called towers, and give them controlled resources, welfare, if you will, and just see what will happen. And he coined this term called behavioral sync. He said that the rats were no longer rats. The environment totally changed them. Uh, the rats did things they had never, that he had never seen before from chewing on each other's tails. He also said that the juveniles had been a bit Again, being very strategic with the wording, he said the juveniles would gang up and would attack the older males. Right? They also would gang up and rape 
other rats. And long story short, he said that if America was to continue upon their, uh, their path of creating these high density living situations with control resources, et cetera, uh, they will recreate in humans what he has discovered in his rats. At the time, he was funded by HUD and the US Army. Uh, they said that he was crazy. He was beyond his prime. He's now starting to compare rats to people. And they basically defunded him and um, I told the world he was crazy. But he wrote an open letter to the US government saying, once again, that if you do this, you will create this response from the inhabitants of public housing. And not only that, he also added that the United States is interested in creating the problem that he has discovered in mice. He said that the US is interested in creating that in people as opposed to stopping it from happening. So John B. Calhoun, interesting guy, YouTube videos, they're very boring, but if you think about hip hop as you watch them, uh, they become a little bit more exciting. But uh, John B. Calhoun warned him about this as he talked about rats, and that's why when I tell kids, if you've ever listened to hip hop, you may have heard the word hood rat. So I say hood rat actually has some type of history to it. So it's not just a word we made up and have fun with, but uh, yeah, hood rat has a, a whole new meaning once you know the history. So that's very deep about looking at what hip hop architecture is and how we can use lyrics to analyze the environments that we are living in and to critique them. Uh, but now to the more lighter part, like what is it? Like people always say, I wanna see what hip hop architecture is. Uh, rap is just one of the elements of hip hop. So that's the MC. Another element from hip hop is break dancing. Uh, so here I say, can we analyze the, what I call the structural stability of break dancers, right? When break dancers are going at each other, they will be able to hold different poses or freezes, right? So it must be some type of structural stability that we can study from those, um, art, from those break dancers and then translate that into new products. So these are some images created by um, an artist named Florian Nicole, again, that looks at breaking down and capturing the structural stability of breakers. Uh, can we use this information to talk to individuals about creating products, right? So can that structural stability now be translated into furniture, right? So can we take uh, furniture, can the furniture be flexible and movable uh, just like the uh, breakers themselves and now become products that are influenced by breakdancing? Uh, there are hip hop artists who are also looking at creating furniture. So Pharrell Williams, uh, I think everybody knows who Pharrell is. If you don't know who he is, you know what the song Happy is, because it played forever. Uh, but Pharrell Williams has a very deep interest uh, in architecture. So not only is he one of the greatest uh, rappers and music producers, uh, but he is also uh, very involved with architecture and uh, interior design. So he has a book called Places and Spaces I've Been, which is all about um, architecture uh, and art. Uh, again, that's Pharrell Williams. But this is some chairs he created called the Perspective Chair. And it's a very interesting perspective. If you can get the perspective that he's trying to get, I won't tell you what it is, but it's, it's definitely a perspective he's trying to show there. And uh, Pharrell Williams also has another project. So I often say, is hip hop architecture simply hip hop artists who are creating architecture? So in this project uh, with Oppenheim, uh, Pharrell was creating a, what he calls the Pharrell Williams Resource Center. So he wanted to provide all the resources that were missing in communities and be able to help those young individuals flourish and become the best possible uh, representation of themselves that they can become. So uh, this is a few images from uh, that project which is in Virginia Beach. And this is a project that is kind of the definition of what hip hop architecture is. So this is a project that I'm working on um, in the Bronx. Uh, it was started by a number of hip hop artists, uh, not just any hip hop artists, but the hip hop artists who created hip hop, like the people who actually came up with the term hip hop are, beyond, are behind this museum. So people like uh, Curtis Blow, you also have individuals like LL Cool J, um, Ice-T, which is funny when I talk to a lot of youth today, they don't know that Ice-T was a rapper, they think he's just an actor. Uh, 
But a lot of hip hop artists came together to start this museum uh, about seven years ago. And within the past two years, I've been working on a project with them to, visual, uh, to create visuals for it. And now we have a site uh, in the Bronx. So we won a, uh, we put in a request, responded to a request for proposals from the city. And now we have a site along uh, the Harlem River. So I worked with Autodesk and Microsoft at two different times to conduct uh, what I call these uh, Universal Hip Hop Museum design ciphers. So instead of doing design charrettes, I wanted to make the language more specific to hip hop because you send out this information about a design charrette and all architects, designers, interior designers, you're excited, it's a charrette. And then I'm getting all these questions, what the hell is a charrette? Uh, so once I say it's a design cipher, right, that language becomes something that they can automatically respond to. They know it's a cipher. We're going to come. We're going to sit down. We're going to jam about some ideas uh, and create something great. So this is Curtis Blow. Curtis Blow was the uh, first individual rapper to uh, receive a recording contract. Uh, so he is the main voice behind the project. But we activated an abandoned courthouse in the Bronx. And we did this three-day design charrette where Autodesk came in. We did training for the hip-hop artists to be able to learn how to do 3D modeling and also 3D printing so that they can create the representations of the museums that would tell, them sto tell their stories. We wanted to give them the ability to do that themselves. Why should an architect, designer, urban planner, whomever, come in and now interpret their story through design? We wanted to empower and enable them to do this themselves. So Autodesk was instrumental in making that happen. Uh, we also had Netflix come in and screen a movie inside of this abandoned space. Well, not a movie, but a series. It's called The Get Down. So a couple months before The Get Down was on Netflix, they came and did a special screening uh, in this abandoned courthouse. We had Spike Lee, uh, Will Smith's son, Jaden Smith, uh, ASAP Rocky. A lot of the people who were in the film uh, came and uh, were a part of that screening. Uh, and then we went around and did this in other cities. So we went to LA, Atlanta, Detroit, uh, back to New York. And this was a second design cipher. This picture is the Sugar Hill Gang. Uh, if you don't know who the Sugar Hill Gang is, I know you know this song. Hip hop, the hippie to the hippie to the hip hip hop. You don't stop a rocket to the... Right, that old song that was like the first recorded hip hop song. Well, people say it was the first recorded hip hop song. Uh, but that's the Sugar Hill Gang. And we went around to... Uh, multiple cities, just asking people in the community, what is hip hop to you? And as we create this museum, what should we have in a museum? How should it look? What type of exhibit should we have? Uh, what type of emotion should we evoke, et cetera? And I won't go through all of these, but we had some very interesting teams uh, where we would go through and list the big picture ideas. So if you design this museum, how can you describe it in one word? What should the um, exhibits be? And I created this book that shows the similarities from city to city and from group to group. And this is how we created the program for the museum. So the program for the museum was actually created by hip hop artists and by community, community members. So again, this is the project. Uh, the first two floors is the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Uh, all together, it's about 65,000 square feet. Uh, on top is public housing. So hip hop is this constant critique of public housing. So if anybody's going to fix it, it should be hip hop artists. And we can't mess it up no more than the US government or anybody else have done. So now hip hop is taking a stab at making public housing better by putting in some of those resources that were extracted away as public housing was built around the country. Uh, so that's public housing on the top. There's a boutique hotel that's rising in the back. Uh, along the river, uh, there are retail spaces. So it's a mixed-use development that totals about 650,000 square feet. Uh, the project is being led by a development company called l and uh, The main architects are S9 Architects out of New York. And the museum is having this space uh, given to them, and they're doing the, the interior fit-out of that space uh, that's coming to the museum. So once this project is completed, which is slated for completion in 2022, uh, this will be the definition of what hip hop architecture is from start to finish. Again, we enabled hip hop artists to create their own designs. They were holding, they were tripping out. They created 3D models and they were holding their concepts in their hand by the end of the third day. And these were some very simple 3D models, but the fact that they created the model themselves and they told the exact story that they wanted to tell, 
uh, it was very liberating to be able to uh, have that experience. And from all of these lectures and presentations I've done across the country, the process of going through uh, designing the Universal Hip Hop Museum, I've created what's called the Hip Hop Architecture Camp. And this is a way to, that I distilled this information down and packaged it so that I can teach the next generation of architects, interior designers, urban planners, et cetera, uh, how to bring their culture uh, into architecture. It's also a response to the uh, very, well, the lack of diversity within the profession, right? In the United States, less than 3% of architects are African American, and then uh, less than a half of a percent, less than half of a percent are African American women. So it's something like 0.2% of licensed architects in the US are African American women. So this is a way that I am working uh, to increase diversity. And this camp is uh, sponsored nationally by Autodesk. Uh, it started off as a project working with the city of Madison. Uh, the city of Madison was having this engagement, uh, citywide engagement called Imagine Madison. They were creating their comprehensive plan that looks 20 years into the future of Madison, but they were missing the mark. It wasn't any diversity. I approached the mayor's office, the city planning department, and said, hey, let me run this hip hop architecture camp and I can get people that you'll probably never get to come to a city planning meeting uh, to come in and tell you what they think Madison should be 20 years from now. It worked. Madison Public Library gave us a space. We did it. Uh, it went great. Uh, the camp has been featured in a number of different locations. So we have been featured on ESPN, uh, The Undefeated, uh, Architect Magazine. Uh, we were recently on the Today Show, uh, Blavity, a lot of hip hop magazines. Uh, my strategy here is to put architecture and design in places outside of the norm, right? Uh, if we continue to only publish in architecture magazines and journals, blogs, et cetera, only people who already know about their world will see it. So my idea here was to put architecture and design on a different platform and different media to hopefully attract those individuals we were trying to attract. Uh, so the camps happen all across the country, and we have one coming to North York uh, later on uh, this summer. And the camp happens in a couple different formats. I won't talk about too much, but uh, we have a one-week camp that happens in different cities throughout the country. Uh, now happen internationally for the first time. And we also have a 13-week after-school program. Uh, so it started off as youth, but now it's also a community engagement tool. So we're working with architecture firms, uh, city planning departments uh, throughout the country to help them uh, reach populations that they normally cannot reach. So what started off as a tool for kids have now become, has now become a serious community engagement workshop. But the website to learn more is hiphoparchitecture.com. And again, here's the one that's happening at North York. Uh, it's going to be July 16th through July 20th. So if anybody want to come and uh, participate, maybe you want to invite youth to come and see one of your showrooms uh, to learn about your products, to see architecture, I'm definitely open to having uh, those conversations. And last, I just want to show you some of the creativity, some of the things that happens when we create uh, what is hip-hop architecture. So this was a quote that uh, fueled my thesis when I was a graduate student uh, at the University of Detroit. Uh, my thesis was on uh, hip-hop and architecture. So it's music is liquid architecture, and architecture is frozen music. So uh, this is also kind of a quote that I built the curriculum for the camp around. So one of the things that I have kids do is um, I often critique people by saying that you critique hip hop, say you don't like it, but you really haven't listened to it, right? You've heard it, but you don't know exactly what they're saying. Uh, so I slow the music down. We have students print off the lyrics, and they do things like rhyme analysis, right? They're finding rhyme schemes, patterns, things that we can easily translate to architecture. Uh, so the, the verbiage there uh, translates to architecture, and it's something they already know. But they're reading lyrics word for word. And then after doing that, we create something called a bar graph. Uh, usually when kids find out they're about to do a bar graph in the summer, it's like, oh crap, I didn't expect this. But it's not a bar graph, a traditional bar graph. Every line in hip hop is called a bar. And now I'm getting students to make graphs of hip hop music. 
All right, and then from those bar graphs, they start to now build music. How can you take the analyses uh, that you've created of music and now start to create something that is three-dimensional? So we work with Legos. You see different Lego pieces. They usually have a different meaning to them. Uh, and now they're creating structures so they can now hold music uh, in their hand. And after doing that, uh, we turn to Autodesk and we use a free program called Autodesk Tinkercad and we have them create cities, communities, and spaces that they would want to have um, and they create them in 3D. So here's a young lady Can doing Can you explain that. what you're doing? Yeah. What you up to? I'm finishing my city. You're finishing your city? Mm -hmm. What's it about? I'm sorry, what? Chance the Rapper. So she's talking about Chance, Chance the, rapper. the Rapper. Well, explain it to me. What'd you do? But she's I mean, not interested in talking to the videographer at all. She just wants to do her work. Which one? Um, because it's about Chance the Rapper, one of her icons. And she's made a city that is based on his no lyrics. Pro no, no problem? All right. And then after, sorry, after we do this, uh, they create, again, the spaces and places they want to see. We do 3D printing. They print these models off. Uh, but then we have kids create a rap song about their project, about their critique of their environment. And these are some of the best songs that I have heard. Kids do an amazing job. They have to write the song within one hour. Uh, they win headphones. We have a rap contest. Uh, it's amazing. So we're doing a, a rap contest at an architecture camp. Uh, but this is one of the songs. Uh, that was written by uh, a young lady in Los Angeles. And this is her actually performing during the camp after she had just wrote it. Uh, they get a theme, which is build it up, and they just have to make a song. So I'll let you hear her. You're going to hear some clapping in the background. These are kids acknowledging that she won the contest. A lot of them didn't want to go after she went. Turn it up. You should say, oh, turn it up. Y'all should know I have a dream, just like Dr. King. I think kids across the world could be onto better things, but instead they shooting up the streets, running from police. It's our job to bring peace to our community, but we all know before peace there has to be a plan. So first we should evaluate where the problem's at. Community says gang activity, drugs, poverty, prostitution, brutality, there's no morality. I got a few ways on how we can make it better. First, we all can start by using architecture, building gardens, parks, recreation centers. These can keep kids from becoming gang members. Jobs, churches, and even bakeries can help the homeless and keep them off the streets. We got to start to work from the bottom up. That's how we're going to change it up, clean it up, build it up. Yeah. So, you can clap for her. There we go. So, after one hour, um, they create these songs, but it's all based on their own visions for making their communities better and them recognizing that architecture is beyond bricks and mortar. All right, architects, designers, we are creating the environments where social interactions occur. And we can argue that maybe we have created environments that is maybe cultivating or supporting some uh, actions that disproportionately affect communities of color. So can we think of it differently? And this is what the songs uh, speak to. So if you go to hiphoparchitecture.com, you can see songs from every single city. Uh, there are good music videos as well. And all of them are very conscious. So through this process of reading every word that their favorite hip-hop artists talk about, they know things they shouldn't repeat. It's like, oh, I never knew that song said that. I don't like it anymore. Or, man, I never knew they talked about something so deep. Uh, I need to repeat that in my song. <clears throat> So here's another so example. With drugs and gangs, just to think if you can feel a single mother's pain. We got gentrification taking over the nation. No schools got us lost in searching for our education. Then I'm embracing our brains got us locked in these chains. Having police that can actually think so we can all be in unity. A community with diversity. Everyone go to university. Provide the city's kids with new programs for the school. Keeping diversity is the number one rule. We gotta give back, we gotta make a change. Don't do anything, and these will be the same. Kids of the generation gotta work together, take it step by step, and we could do better. Push my paws, I push my paws, I it up and up. Soul's heart is metal. Keep it real in the D. Our soul's heart is metal. Street lights help keep people safe. People get killed in the streets every day. With hip hop, can we can't change this? We got a dream, we can achieve this. What the future of the hood gonna be? We gotta build it up for the 313. What the future of the hood gonna be? We gotta build it up for the 313.
Good enough to the 313. About to be a breeze, big fella. So, you know, in this video, the young man is talking about street lights help keep people safe, right? He's in Detroit. And he can remember when there were no street lights in his community in Detroit because of the financial issues with the city. So as he designed his community, he designed street lights. And how can we make street lights something more affordable for cities so that people such as me who live in certain areas in the city, uh, we don't have to live without street lights. And he talked about people being killed because of no street lights. So again, he's talking about how design has a role uh, in what happens in communities. Getting them again to read lyrics such as that and then create these, uh, these rap analysis uh, which I call, I make it sound fancy, lyrical dexterity of MC. So being able to figure out some of the things that they are doing in those songs. And then, you know, one of the favorite lines from that song uh, is, you know, he says, I'm a man on a mission. I'm reaching out to my children just hoping that they will listen. Start a new coalition. You should take recognition. Uh, but they take those rhyme schemes, and then based on the complexity of the rhyme scheme itself, we can describe different volumes to how complex that rhyme is. And then they start to visualize cities uh, that come directly from uh, the rhyme schemes discovered uh, in the music. So again, now taking me against the world and looking at the rhyme schemes, the patterns, and now can they start to create uh, these masses of cities uh, that they can then uh, develop further. Uh, and this happens with multiple songs, a song by Lauryn Hill, um, big pun, but they print these out and eventually these cities, which I call hip hop cities, uh, the kids will uh, develop a lot further. It's a song by Kanye West and Lupe Fiasco. Uh, and then we create pieces of artwork, right? So how can kids not only use their cultural competency or their, their what I call cultural genius, like can they start to create pieces of artwork, right? Music is art. So can these rap analyses uh, become something uh, that the kids can produce and either sell or share uh, for motivation for themselves about how rich uh, hip hop music is. So this is looking at a song called I Go to Work by Kumo D, but it's looking at all of those rhyme schemes uh, that are there. It's another one called Follow the Leader by Eric B uh, and Rakim. So it's taking lyrics and now turning them into uh, products. Uh, and last, to close out, so this whole program and everything I've been doing, I won an innovation award uh, with Madison Public Library from a group called the Urban Libraries Council. So it's a national group that most libraries in the U.S. are members of. And in 2017, we received a national award as the top innovator for race and social equity planning. Uh, so it was very... Uh, one, a surprise that uh, a hip hop program would win that and be recognized by a library, but this has turned into uh, over 30 libraries across the country now implementing uh, this program uh, at their public libraries. So it's a free program for students too, something else I should mention. Uh, it's free, kids don't pay for it. Uh, they receive a lot of technology, uh, but Autodesk help make it free along with uh, local, local sponsors. And that's what I propose to any designers, any architects, urban planners working uh, not only in communities of color, but working anywhere. Just stop, uh, collaborate, and listen. Let's no longer design for communities, but find ways to design with communities. Thanks. Hi. Um, amazing presentation. And I really liked how you were um, describing hip hop as this critique of Postmodernism, or it was a modernism. Modernism, sorry, modern, yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering if, like, some of those are general, right? And I'm wondering if you've ever taken it to the point, or intend to, to bring that critique to very specific locations. So, for example, like, you could look at um, artists in the West End of Toronto, and their critique of the architecture in the West End of Toronto versus artists in the East End of Toronto or other cities, um, where these ones kind of speak to specifically, the, you gave an example of the Bronx, but a lot of them talk about a general condition. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering if you ever thought of that critique specifically and if that critique could perhaps inform policy in cities. Yeah, so I guess a short answer to that, yeah, hip hop is very like regional, it's very region specific. So I think every artist is influenced by their immediate environment. 
So there are a ton of songs out there that are specific to each locale. I mean, you actually have some artists who will mention the streets that they live on um, or that they're talking about or the housing project uh, that they live in. So that's something that does happen. Uh, it's out there. Um, and when I'm working with youth, we usually look at artists that are from that city. So when we come here to Toronto, we'll be looking at Drake and his constant mention of the six. Uh, I never knew Toronto as the six until I listened to Drake. I don't know, maybe he named it the six, I don't know. But uh, we often look at artists that are local. And yeah, it's, um, as technology makes access to music a little easier, uh, hip hop is starting to lose its very region specific language, uh, but it's still there. It's there a lot. Any other questions? Um, you clearly have a very um, clear message of how you want to increase diversity in the architecture industry, but I was wondering if you had any other ideas how this could be improved for women, for all kinds? Yeah, I think um, that's, a, that's a great question. So the organization um, that I started, uh, it's called the Urban Arts Collective. So I started this along with two other friends who grew up in Detroit. And the Urban Arts Collective is the organization which I run the hip hop architecture camps through. <clears throat> and that was our first mission for diversity. It's about just minorities in general. And now we have one called uh, 400 Forward, which looks at uh, the, recently the 400th black woman was licensed, uh, became a licensed architect in the United States. 400, since architecture existed, the 400th black woman got her license uh, not long ago. Um, so we won a grant to start a program called 400 Forward, which looks at creating the next 400 uh, African-American uh, architects. But I think hip hop in general, uh, anything that you tie to hip hop, it's become like the ultimate branding tool, but it's also the, the best tool to bring recognition to any situation, whether it's global warming or just the lack of diversity. So I think um, one way that we could use hip hop to talk about the lack of diversity is trying to bring those situations up in a message that will reverberate around the world a lot faster than any other medium. You know, we can write papers, um, but hip hop can get a message around the world uh, within a day, all right? And you got someone in China or Japan, Europe, they're listening to it within a day. So if there's a way to bring that message, um, you know, I would say that's maybe a challenge for you. How can we? Uh, use hip hop to help promote diversity for uh, for other groups, but it's there. I think it's the possibilities are there. We have, uh, time for one more question. So, I'll pass over here. Um, I like um, how you talked about the localization of architecture and of, and hip hop. Um, how would you describe the parallels between hip hop in the United States and America and dance hall, which I view as the hip hop and music of the Caribbean? Um, and it talks about the struggle there and, it, and people talk about their lived experience and it's a way to communicate with the wider world. And uh, Toronto hip hop especially has started to merge with dance hall culture and beats um, do you have any comments on that? Uh, I won't say like I'm like the dance hall expert, so I won't you know, disrespect that culture, try to act like I know everything about it. But I will say this. Uh, again, every community, every race, every, you know, again, you can't hide from hip hop if you wanted to. Um, so there are parallels, and I think the parallel from every region or every place that I've been, like earlier I mentioned going to Warsaw, Poland, um, I noticed that they use hip hop to tell some of, you know, their struggles, some of the things that they wanted to see in their communities or things they were tired of seeing in their communities. They use hip hop uh, to do it. And I think that's the exact same thing we're doing in America. Uh, only difference is their struggles may be a lot different than what someone in Detroit may be talking about versus what someone in Warsaw. But that medium has proven to be uh, the best medium um, to do it. So I think those are the parallels. It's a medium to express yourself. And uh, it's quickly becoming 
a medium to push product, um, which may be a challenge to people who want to tell stories. Uh, and what's happening, I was having this conversation earlier, people hear the dismay or the, uh, the hard conditions that a lot of youth live in. And instead of saying, man, that's horrible, let's go and fix it, now people are saying, oh, tell me another story and slap on the name of my product to that story that you're telling too, as opposed to saying, man, it's bad that this is happening, how can we fix it? So that's the problem we're dealing with hip hop across the world is how do we keep using it as a medium to tell stories and also encourage people to come fix problems as opposed to simply uh, promoting products. It's cool. So thank you all for coming out and hopefully we can connect after this. Thanks. <laughs>